disposal. We're going to take a look at some of the problems associated with waste and how we deal with waste, uh, particularly in the United States. And so let's begin by defining what waste is. Waste is unwanted or undesired material. Now in this class we are going to pay attention to two major types. We're going to look at solid waste. This is the waste that we tend to generate on an everyday basis and a small portion of that which is classified as hazardous waste and we'll take a look at the differences. What we will not be talking about is human waste, the generation and disposal of human waste. We're going to confine our discussion to solid waste and hazardous waste. Now waste management is the collection, treatment, and disposal of different types of waste. Uh, here in the Valley we have Republic Services which generally has, have a monopoly on most if not all of your waste uh, disposal services. Now this should come as no surprise to anybody but as a country we generate more waste per person per day than any other country. Now remember we have about four to five percent of the global population and yet we generate a third of all of the solid waste generated on earth. That is absolutely ridiculous ladies and gentlemen and we'll talk about why that is as we go through today's lecture. Now that 33 percent amounts to about 12 billion tons of waste every year and if you do this per capita or per person it comes out to about four and a half pounds of waste per person per day. Now obviously some people will generate, generate less, some people will generate more, but that's about the average, about five pounds uh, per person per day. Now if we look at where the waste comes from, the majority of waste, and by the way, we're talking about U.S. waste right now, um, about half, more than half, 53% comes from agriculture. You can see here, uh, a fairly large component is animal waste. That would be, you know, carcasses from, from cattle industry, um, and then 14% from crop residue. So by far the biggest component is agriculture. Next is mining. I, now I know we haven't talked about minerals and mining yet, but we're going to see that mining, minerals, coal generates quite a lot of waste. Um, we have about 5% as MSW. This is what is known as municipal solid waste. This is the waste that you generate on a daily basis. Food scraps, uh, plastic, uh, if you throw away um, old clothes. This is essentially what ends up in your trash and what's taken to landfills. Now that 5% amounts to about 262 million tons every year or at least it did back in 2015. Now the other small component here, this 3%, would be industrial waste. That's the waste generated through the creation of industrial products. So agriculture number one, mining number two, and then a much smaller component is the garbage that we generate on an everyday basis. Now if we look at that MSW, and we look at how much we generate per year, what you'll see here, guys, is the orange line and these numbers here are waste per person per day. So if you go back to 1960, we were generating just a little bit over two and a half pounds per person per day, and we were generating 88 million tons every year. And you'll notice as we've gone along, guys, uh, our total waste has increased dramatically, but our per capita waste has also increased. Uh, you actually see a slight dip here. We were up to about 4.72 uh, in 2000, or a little uh, over 2000, and then we've dipped a little bit, but not much. Uh, and so we've we've pretty much um, increased waste generation uh, as we've gone along. Now as far as what ends up, what do we throw out? What, en what ends up in that municipal solid waste? Um, <clears throat> this was a 2010 study. The biggest component 
is paper and paperboard or cardboard if you prefer that term 28 and a half percent followed by food scraps number two yard waste number three plastics number four if you look at just those the four biggest components paper and plastic something that's easily recyclable yet a lot of us choose not to do that and we'll talk about why that is a little bit later on today the other two food scraps and yard waste we're going to talk about composting in a couple minutes those both of those are what are called organic waste and both of those can be composted they don't have to end up in our landfills uh, you can see the other minor ones metals rather uh, rubber leather and textiles wood glass and then other but by far a large component of what ends up in our landfills because that's our number one option in the US are things that don't have to end up we a lot of us choose not to recycle in this country now what we're going to take a look at now is the four ways that we can dispose of solid waste we can bury it we can dump it, we can burn it, or we can compost it. Now we'll take a look at each of these in a lot more detail, but let's look at the burial option number one. What we choose to do in this country is we use what are called sanitary landfills. We bury it, but we bury it with certain restrictions, and we'll talk about what those are here in a little bit. This is what we tend to do in this country. And I think, my opinion, is that most of the time, once we bury it, it's out of sight, out of mind. Well, that we, we can't see that waste anymore, so it can't hurt us. We can't add contamination. Well, that's false, ladies and gentlemen. The second option is to dump it. Yes, this is the illegal option, but it doesn't stop people from doing it. What dumping is, is putting waste anywhere other than a permitted location. Uh, back in the day, before the EPA, open dumps were actually how a community would, would dispose of their waste. You'd dig a big hole, you'd come in, you'd pay somebody, you'd dump your waste in that hole, and you'd leave. And when it was all full, they'd bury it. Um, and that was pretty much it. There was no, uh, no restrictions, no anything. Those are now illegal. We use sanitary landfills. Now, I, when I think of dumping... Um, I think of this. It, once again, it's the d disposal in any location other than where it goes. And we've all done it. We've had that after that nutritious lunch of McDonald's. We fold up the bag. We crumple the bag. We shoot for the nearest waste container thinking that we're Michael Jordan. And we miss. And we walk away. That's dumping, ladies and gentlemen. Does that waste go on the ground like that? No. Okay, so unfortunately, especially in urban centers, dumping has become a real problem. People just dump their waste uh, from a car window, uh, dump it in the middle of night, and unfortunately we then have to deal with the ramifications. Uh, the third option is to burn it, incineration. Now, I know we haven't gotten to energy yet. But once we get to um, renewable energy sources, we're going to talk about something called biomass. This is the burning of wood, agricultural waste, or yes, even everyday garbage for energy. I'm going to mention this as we get to incineration, but we're going to talk much more about this when we get to our energy resources. And then lastly, composting. We'll talk about what composting is and what sources of waste we can actually compost. But let's start with the first option, the burial option, and let's talk about what a sanitary landfill is. So here's what a sanitary landfill is. We, we pick out a location. We've met all the requirements for building a sanitary landfill. We dig a big hole or, or a pit, and we line that pit with impermeable material. That word impermeable means that gases and fluids can't pass through it. Most of that, most of the time, that material is clay. Clay is a pretty good impermeable liner. So the first thing we do is we line the pit with clay, and then we may also put plastic liners down as well. We want to make sure that 
any liquid waste that is generated in that landfill, and by the way, liquid waste, we give the term leachate, we want to make sure that leachate does not escape the landfill, infiltrate into our subsurface, and contaminate our groundwater system. Okay, We'll talk about what groundwater is a little bit later, but for now, subsurface water. So we don't want to contaminate our subsurface water. That's the purpose of that clay liner and those plastic liners. Um, generally, what most sanitary landfills do today is they collect the leachate, they pump it, they store it at the surface, and they either have somebody come along and clean it up, or they clean it up themselves. Now, at the end of the day, we cover all of the waste that was dumped that day, I shouldn't say dumped, that was disposed of that day, with more impermeable material. There's a purpose to that, that as well. If it rains, we don't want that rainwater getting into the waste and creating more leachate because that's going to create more problems for us. So it essentially, these sanitary landfills, you're isolating, you're encapsulating every day's waste. You have liners on the bottom, you cover with more impermeable material on the top to essentially isolate. Now, in a lot of cases, sanitary landfills, because through the decomposition process, we generate carbon dioxide gas and methane gas. Well, a lot of modern sanitary landfills will capture that methane and use it to generate electricity. A lot of sanitary landfills are off the grid because they're able to generate enough electricity through the capture of the methane gas. And then right around the perimeter of the sanitary landfill, we have something called monitoring wells. These are wells that we sample the groundwater every three months or so to ensure that our sanitary landfill isn't leaking. Remember, if we own that landfill, we are legally and financially responsible for any contamination cleanup that we have to do. So we want to catch a leak early, where it's a lot cheaper to take care of than later. Now, here's a picture of a sanitary landfill, and I want to point out some of the things we just talked about. So this brown layer right here, guys, here's this clay layer. Okay, this liner, either clay or a combination of clay and plastic liners. That's designed so that leachate doesn't leak down here and contaminate our groundwater resources. You also notice that on top of that liner, this landfill actually has multiple sand layers with PVC piping perforated in it. What that does is as the leachate flows downward under the influence of gravity, it flows into this porous sand layer, flows into the pipes, which then pump the leachate to the surface, and most sanitary landfills actually have a waste treatment facility on site where that leachate is cleaned up and treated. Remember, we don't want it just to sit on the liner, guys, because the liner may crack or we may have holes in it, and that leachate is going to get off site. Here we have, this is a well that's actually drilled into the garbage. This is our methane, what's called the methane recovery well. So as this trash decomposes, we generate methane gas, CH4. Well, the CH4 moves into the well, this recovery well, is then pumped to some kind of electricity generating um, building, where the landfill can then burn the methane gas to generate electricity. Here are these monitoring wells, guys. Okay, So generally speaking, every three months or so, we will sample the groundwater to ensure that our liner is still intact and the leachate is not getting off site. So these are some features of a modern sanitary landfill. Now, here are these what are called cells. So each of these cells represents a day's waste. For an entire day, dump trucks come in and out. They dump the waste. We actually move heavy machinery over it to compact it. Here's the lower impermeable liner 
but then we at the end of each day we stick more clay on top of it so that if it rains the rainwater doesn't come in here and we generate more leachate so what you'll notice is each of these are daily cells we work horizontally and then we move vertically to fill up all the space of, of the landfill uh, here's a picture of a sanitary landfill I used to work at one of these uh, back when I was um, getting my PhD at uh, Southern Illinois University now here's a fairly common picture so every, all day we have these big trucks come in they dump all of their waste at the end of the day okay we're actually going to take these piles of material over here here's that clay so all throughout the day we'll have these large machines go back and forth back and forth to compact the waste at the end of the day we'll pour we'll take this material and we'll dump it on top of the waste and then so the next day we'll actually start this next cell out here and so we move horizontally before moving vertically now if you look at um, states that generate the most waste ladies and gentlemen unfortunately we in Nevada have the distinction of generating the most waste per person of the entire US and a lot of that has to do with uh, our main income source which is tourism people come in and they essentially trash the place but if you look at the top three guys uh, as far as the the three states that generate the most waste Nevada number one uh, Colorado number or I'm sorry Pennsylvania number two and Colorado number three so those are the ones that generate the most waste per person if you look at the fewest um, Idaho North Dakota and Connecticut well Idaho and North Dakota don't have a high population density but they're the ones that generate the least amount of waste now we tend to use sanitary landfills but that doesn't mean they're not without their problems and the first one the biggest problem is yes we have that clay liner at the bottom yes we have that plastic liner yes we have those those PVC pipes that collect the leachate but let's be honest as the landfill closes as it ages the greater the potential for that clay liner to crack and for leachate that's in the landfill to escape and contaminate our groundwater resources so that's our biggest fear is that we have a leaking sanitary landfill that contaminates our groundwater resources and we'll talk about why groundwater is so important a little bit later on the production of that methane through the decomposition process um, old landfills they actually would just vent it to the atmosphere but as we know methane is a greenhouse gas so if we just vent it to the atmosphere then we're gonna have problems with climate change most of it now is either captured or burnt which isn't the, the best process either here's the the problem we need to make sure that we capture it because if the methane builds up methane is flammable and while it sounds funny it's not really there have been sanitary landfills in the past that have exploded because you will get a pocket of methane build up all you need is a spark and you have the potential for an explosion you have to monitor the landfills for decades after you close it so once again you own that sanitary landfill it's closed which means you're not accepting any more waste which means you're not bringing in any more money and yet it is up to you once again from a legal and financial responsibility to make sure that nothing is leaking for decades after that landfill closed um, and then the biggest problem is that we are simply producing a, too much waste that we can't keep up with the construction of new sanitary landfills there are uh, legislation guys of where you can and where you can't build a sanitary landfill so the areas where we can build these things are quite limited 
And so we simply can't keep up with the su supply of all the waste that we generate. And that's a serious problem as well. All right, let's move on to our second option, which is dumping. Once again, we're going to define it as the improper disposal of waste at any other location other than where it belongs. Uh, this is often called midnight dumping because the people that do this usually do it under the cover of darkness. Now, um, here's what happens. So let's say that we own a, uh, a, paint, a painting company. And we've just finished a very large job. And we have, let's say, eight 55-gallon drums of paint waste. Turpentine, excess paint, whatever. Now, we have to pay somebody to properly dispose of that waste. Or we have another option. We can save some money, and under the cover of darkness, we can dump all that paint waste out behind our, our company. Guess what a lot of people chose to do? Well, to dump it. So, prior to the 1970s, remember that's when the EPA was established, a lot of companies dumped because there was no environmental legislations. Remember, the 1970s, this is where we passed most of the environmental laws. Remember, it was the golden age of environmental legislation. So, prior to that, there were no laws in place. Okay? And so, essentially, hey, let's save a couple bucks, let's go out and dump the waste. Uh, and as you can see from the pictures above, the picture on the top left, uh, you can't tell it, but that was an old dry uh, creek bed. And so somebody thought, yeah, that would be a good idea to put my waste, and a lot of people followed his example. The picture on the top right is what happens when we dump into the oceans a lot of that waste becomes concentrated due to the, the surface currents and often it washes back up on shore. Now the problem with these, these dumps is that they pose a fairly significant risk to human health. Not only might you have exposure to hazardous materials, batteries, chemicals, uh, there have even been used syringes that have washed up on beaches in the past. Those very, very serious health risk. The other thing that these dumps do is they tend to attract rodents and insects, especially if there's food in the garbage, and these can be the carriers of infectious diseases. Remember we talked about how mosquitoes can carry infectious diseases, well rodents can as well. Okay, uh, If you guys remember the bubonic plague, bubonic plague was carried by inf infected uh, ticks, I'm sorry, infected lice that actually then jumped to rats and this is how the, the Black Plague spread back in the 1300s. So, it, yes, it, it is illegal, but there's also very serious uh, ramifications for this as well. Now, I, I like to use this picture as, as kind of a summary on human nature. We tend not to follow the rules, ladies and gentlemen. And, and if you drive around the valley, you'll see a lot of these no dumping signs. And often what you'll see in the abandoned uh, sites is a lot of people that have dumped their garbage. Once again, okay, to save some money, you'll put it where it doesn't go. And then somebody else will have to deal with that problem. Now, the dumping issue actually led to a fair, fairly serious issue um, back prior to the 1970s. So prior to 1972, in, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, we dumped a lot of waste into the oceans. And so in the early 70s, we had fairly high concentrations of a lot of things, plastics and chemicals in our oceans. Uh, pretty much it was a smorgasbord of a lot of things that posed serious risk to human health, heavy metals, inorganic nutrients, chemicals, and yes, even some radioactive waste. And so we realized that we had to do something to curb these dumping activities, and so we passed the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act. This was passed in 1972. Now that's the official name, but most people call it the Ocean Dumping Act. 
what this law did was it regulated the dumping of any materials into the oceans which would adversely affect human health and so it set up um, what would happen if you were caught dumping it would essentially remember the EPA is that governmental agency with the power to punish those that break these environmental laws now yes it has cut down on the amount of waste that we have illegally dumped into the oceans yes it's done that has it eliminated it no and proof of that is in something called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this. What this is, it's a floating island of garbage that has actually been trapped by the surface currents in the North Pacific Ocean. So here's where this floating island of garbage is, uh, is kind of caught in these uh, oceanic surface currents. Now, it contains anything that has a lower density than water. So anything that essentially is going to float on water. Uh, plastics, cardboard, paper, wrappers, all of these things that can float are trapped. Now, we've been recording this, we've known about this actually for years, actually for, for a decade or more. And obviously this floating island of garbage is actually getting bigger. Every year it gets a little bit bigger. Estimates right now have it at about twice the size of Texas. So just consider that for a second, guys. We have a floating island of garbage that is to Texas, uh, as far as area, two Texas-sized chunks trapped by these North Pacific currents. And once again, it gets bigger every year. Now, here's the problem, okay? Um, who's going to clean it up? Who's going to pay to clean it up? It's going to cost tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to clean up. And so here's what we say. The U.S. says, well, it's not our fault. It's China's fault. Uh, and then China says, well, we didn't do any of that. It's the United States' fault, okay? And so we point at each other and blame each other but nobody actually wants to spend the money to clean it up and that's why it's getting bigger is yes the the ocean dumping act has reduced the amount but there are people that still will dump their trash into the ocean to save a buck unfortunately our third choice is incineration this is the burning of solid waste now the good news is it can reduce the volume of solid waste by 87 percent so if we start with a ton of garbage guys we're only going to end up with 13 percent of the original amount so that's the good news the other thing is it can generate electricity that's that biomass guys we'll talk about biomass later but biomass is defined as the burning of wood agricultural waste or even garbage for energy so we burn the waste we essentially take the heat from that burning process we turn water into steam and we turn a turbine to generate electricity that's kind of simply put how we can generate electricity here however there are some fairly serious disadvantages the first one is whenever you burn anything especially anything that's organic waste that used to be alive when you burn wood guys that wood is a hydrocarbon it has carbon and hydrogen in its structure whenever you burn it remember you're just adding oxygen so the biggest byproduct of any burning activity is co2 gas which as we know is the largest or the most abundant anthropogenic greenhouse gas which leads to an enhanced greenhouse effect which leads to global warming the ash the the 13 percent that won't be burned generally will contain hazardous materials in it heavy metals chemicals and so we have to properly treat or properly dispose of that ash as hazardous waste which increases the cost and then also um, because there are strict regulations uh, we have to use things called air scrubbers anything anytime we burn we have to pass the exhaust through air scrubbers that remove 
some of the greenhouse gas, some of the particulate matter before it goes up uh, the chimney into the atmosphere. Well, all of those air scrubbers and all of those other regulations um, cost more. So these incineration plants have higher costs, higher costs to maintain, and so it's going to cost more to burn the trash. Now, here's a, a standard setup here, guys. Let me just go through the basics here. So we dump our waste, whatever we're going to burn, agricultural waste, wood, garbage, whatever. We then push it into an oven. That oven generates heat. That heat, once again, turns water into steam. The steam turns a turbine, which generates an electrical current, an AC-DC current. Now, here's the problem. Here's five. This is the ash, the, the things that simply won't be consumed through burning, and we have to treat that now as hazardous material. Um, what these six and seven are, guys, here's our air scrubbers. And air scrubbers is just a generic term for any device that removes greenhouse gas and some of the very fine solid particulate matter before the exhaust then goes up the chimney into the atmosphere. We have to use these air scrubbers, guys, because the EPA has come in and said, okay, based on the size of your operation, this is how much air pollution you can produce in a certain year. And so if we produce more air pollution that goes into the atmosphere, we get fined, maybe we get shut down, maybe we get jailed. And so we often use multiple, multiple air scrubbers so that what we're releasing is going to allow us to get under um, that allotment of air pollution that we're um, allowed to generate every year. Our last option is composting. Now what composting is, is we let bacteria and other decomposers break down organic waste for us, generally in the presence of oxygen, which is why we call it aerobic decomposition. So if you've never seen a compost pile, guys, what, what a lot of people uh, in rural areas will do is they'll take um, leaves and um, grass clippings and food waste and maybe even uh, you know pet waste and they'll put it in this big pot as you can see from the picture and essentially what happens is bacteria get in there other decomposers get in there and over time they'll act to break that organic waste down and what you're left with is actually very very fertile material and in a lot of cases what they'll do is they'll take that compost material They'll spread it on gardens or maybe even agricultural fields. And that then returns the nutrients to the soil, which are then used by the plants. So there is a good reason to do this. Very, very fertile, organic-rich material is the result. Now here's the important reason of why we should compost. Is about 25%, about a fourth of all of our MSW is organic waste. Food scraps, remember, was number two, and yard waste was number three. Both of those things are considered organic waste and can be composted. Now here's the problem, especially in urban areas like Las Vegas. Believe it or not, there's actually a law, and most of your HOAs have laws against having a compost pile in your yard. The reason for it is, as you might imagine, as through the decomposition process, you tend to generate gases that are quite smelly. So if you've never been around a compost pile, it smells because you generate methane and other gases, even hydrogen sulfide gas, that tends to give off fairly noxious odors. And so generally in large urban areas, you generally have rules that say you can't do this. And so most of your composting is done off-site. Um, about a decade ago, they, they actually stopped doing this a couple years, but what they used to do is they used to take food waste from all the um, hotels on the Strip, and they would actually ship it out to a pig farm north of Las Vegas. <coughs> 
I think the pig farm closed down, but that's not the point. They would then take all that food waste and they would either feed it to the pigs, which is where it mostly went, or they would then compost it and then spread it on um, agricultural fields out there. And it was, it was a good partnership, is that these hotels would partner with it instead of just throwing that waste away, instead of it going to our uh, landfills, it would essentially be reused. Now, this composting can only be done with organic waste. Okay, plastic, no, you can't compo compost plastic. Um, glass, nope. Okay, so a limited number of things can be composted. It has to be organic waste. All right, now we really should be concentrating not on how to dispose of our waste, but how we can reduce the amount of waste that we generate. Remember, guys. 5% of the global population, and yet we generate a third of the world's garbage. And this is where the two R's come in. Reuse and recycling. Reuse is simply using a product more than once. And we actually have two forms. Conventional reuse, this is using the product for what it was designed. So let's say I have a plastic water bottle, guys. I drink all the water in it, and I fill the bottle up again. That would be conventional reuse that plastic bottle was specifically made to hold liquids. Or there's something else that's becoming popular nowadays uh, called new life reuse. This is using a product for what it was not designed. And let me give you the best example I've come across. If you've ever been across the valley, guys, and gone to a playground, if you have kids, have you guys ever noticed that plastic mat that they put underneath the jungle gym so that kids won't hurt themselves. Guess where that plastic mat came from, guys? It used to be old tires. And so there have, com there have uh, been companies that have realized, hey, there's money to be made in this new life reuse. And so uh, there actually is a company out there that will take old tires, break that rubber down and they'll make these 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 rubber plastic mats for for play playgrounds that would be new life reuse that tire was specifically designed not as something that to help kids not hurt themselves this is new life reuse and once again if there's a market for things guys if, if there's money to be made companies will find it the other thing is recycling this is taking down the old product breaking it down into its raw materials and then taking those raw materials and make new items. Now, here's the problem. And we're gonna talk about this in a little while. There are certain barriers to recycling in the US. The biggest one, you might guess, is money, okay? It often costs money to recycle and so for some products, it simply isn't worth it. Now, if you look at the recycling in the U.S., I know this is a little dated, guys. This is a 2006 data, but this is the best way I've ever seen it displayed. So in that year, we generated 251 million tons of waste, and we recycled about 82 million tons. So about 33% was our recycling. And what you see here, guys, is each of these um, components, you can see the waste that we generated and how much we recycled. So for paper, we recycled just over half. So the green is what we recycled, the brown is what ends up in our landfills. Yard waste, we did a little bit better, we recycled 62%. The rest of these numbers uh, suck, ladies and gentlemen. Food, only about 2% was recycled. Plastic, seven. Metals, a little bit better at 36. Wood, 9.4. Glass, 22. Textiles, that would be clothing, 15. Rubber, leather, leather, 13%. Most of those numbers are fairly low, guys. There's not a lot of green here. Well, much more brown. And so that's what all that waste that ends up in our landfills. Now, this is a through time thing. The red line with the red numbers, this is total waste, million tons per year that we generate. The blue line is what we recycled. So back in 1960, we generated 87 and a half million tons a year. We recycled 
million tons for a recycling rate of a little less than six and a half percent. Now you'll notice the 60s and the 70s guys, our recycling rates were fairly low. And then in the mid 70s, we started to see an uptick. We started to see people recycling more. And so then 2006, once again, the highest we've ever been. But notice the gap guys, okay? We're increasing the gap between what we generate and what we recycle. So we're doing better, but there's still a long way we have to go. Now, let's take a look at some of the, the recycling rates in the U.S. And this was a 2015 study done by the EPA. And so the best of these, and we've gotten so much better in the last decade, is paper and cardboard. So almost 70% of the paper and cardboard used in 2015 was recycled. Yay, great numbers. Especially when you consider, guys, you look back just a decade or even 15 years ago, that number was probably in the 40s. So we have made great strides. Um, metals, ferrous metals. Uh, we're, we'll learn what that word means, guys, but ferrous metals simply means it has iron in it. So any metals that contain iron in it, about 28%. Glass, about 26 There's a problem with recycling glass, guys. In fact, if you look at a lot of the recycling containers across Las Vegas, you'll see no glass. So glass is often hard to recycle, which is why it's so low. Wood, even lower at 16%. Uh, the composting waste, guys, food was only at about 5%. Yard waste was much higher at about 61. And then notice of all of them, look at the low of the low guys. What we recycle the least of in this country is plastic at only about 9%. And there's a reason for this. It is often cheaper to take petroleum and to make new plastic from it than to take old plastic, recycle it. And once again, guys, remember, and I know I, I haven't talked about this a lot. We'll talk about this more when we get to energy and minerals and water. Is the market drives everything, guys. Economics is the key feature. And so if you're talking, if we can do something cheaper, we're going to do it cheaper. Now, there's going to be a day where oil is going to be scarce and the recycling of plastic will probably go up. But it will be driven by the market, by the economy. Now, if you add all of those up, uh, and so for 2015, our recycling rate was 34.8. A little bit higher than the 32.5 back in 2006, but not a great deal higher, guys. Now, we'll see, and this is fairly dated. I, I need to find something um, that's more up to date, but I haven't been able to find it. This is on a per state basis. So these numbers were as of 1999. I know that's two decades old. But you'll notice some states have much higher recycling rates than others do. California, Oregon, and Washington in the West have always been fairly good. But if you look at it, guys, the one state that has the highest recycling rates is New York. And that's because they fine you if you don't recycle. And so there's another... Uh, example of how market drives it guys if you're going to lose money if you don't recycle you better damn well believe that you're going to recycle all that you can't and so new york connecticut new hampshire maine they, they've always been fairly environmentally responsible states if you look at nevada guys and i know this once again is 1999 data but we had fairly low recycling rates about 10 to 19 percent and i'm here to tell you it hasn't gotten that much better now, we're not the worst country. So what this is, is um, the colors represent the waste that ends up in our landfill. That's the gray. The green is what we re recycle and reuse, and the red is, is burned through incineration. So if you look at the, the, th the three best countries as far as waste is our Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Switzerland, and Sweden. Look at how little waste ends up in their landfill. Look at Switzerland, guys. They don't have any waste that ends up in their landfill. They recycle, reuse, or they burn. Okay? We're in the middle. Here's us right here, guys. 
So here's what we burn. Here's what we reuse and recycle. And look at all the gray. Look at all the gray. It keeps going and going and going. But we're not the worst. If you look at the other end, Turkey, Greece, and Poland, they don't use incineration plants. They recycle and reuse very little. And the majority of their waste, maybe 70-75%, ends up in landfills. So we can say we're not the worst, but a lot of our trash, guys. And remember, we have 5% of the population, yet we generate a third of the world's waste. Uh, this is a picture, if you've ever heard of the um, infamous New York garbage barge, that actually um, they had a big uh, landfill. I think it was called the oh, Kills Landfill. I forget, but it was it was out on. Um, they actually had to take a barge out to it to dump all of its trash, uh, and so you'd have these barges going back and forth from the site uh, from the city. I just like the message. Next time, try recycling. Now, let's talk about why we don't recycle as much as we should in this country, and once again, it always comes down to cost. I know I haven't said that enough, and I should have said it more, and I will say it more as we go through, but your market determines everything, guys. Remember in the introduction we talked about economics is what drives the bus for everything, for you, for me, for cities, for countries, for the world, all driven by the market. And so that same market determines recycling rates. So look at it this way and let's go back to our supply and demand guys which remember was controlled by pricing if the price for a product is high let's say jewelry okay gold jewelry price of that is high the recycling rates for that are also going to be high because we can get money by recycling that think about it guys you have a gold chain that breaks do you throw it away of course you don't okay you go to a pawn shop you go to these cash for gold places that have popped up over the last decade and you get money for your gold jewelry okay same for um, smartphones there have uh, businesses have popped up to get the the precious metals that are in your smartphones and so uh, same reason for uh, when we had the 2008 economic downturn guys you probably heard of a lot of stories of people of, of people leaving their homes people would break in and they'd strip the homes of all the copper because they could then take the copper and sell it to scrap yards so price of something is high you're gonna get money back for recycling it and so you're gonna recycle however if the price of something is low think plastic guys then the chance of it being recycled is going to be much much lower the other problem and this is fairly new, guys. I think about three years ago. Uh, it was around 2016, 2017. Is most of our plastic waste we actually would ship to China. And China would then re uh, recycle it, break it down, and make new plastic from it. However, back in 2016, 2017, China stopped taking the world's plastic waste and by the way we weren't the only ones Western Europe uh, Canada Australia uh, a lot of the post-industrial world shipped their plastic waste to China for recycling but now that China is no longer accepting that what we're seeing is a lot of plastic that used to get recycled is now being thrown away because it costs money guys to separate the plastic from the waste and sometimes it's just not cost effective so what we're seeing now is that the United States we used to separate that plastic and ship it off but now it's just not cost effective and so now it just gets thrown away and that's a serious problem uh, cultural attitudes in in this country a lot of us are apathetic if you don't know what that word apathy means it means you don't care and so there's a lot of people that are just like eh. I don't really care about recycling and so it's not important to me therefore I won't do it okay 
And I see a lot of it, uh, uh, unfortunately, especially with the younger generation. Uh, I see a lot of you guys uh, coming out of the classrooms in, in, uh, on campus, and instead of looking for a recycling container, you simply take that, that uh, uh, Red Bull canister or a plastic and you just throw it away because you just, it's not important to you. You don't care about recycling. And then even if we do the right things, guys, even if we, we take that, that old product, we break it down into, into raw materials, we still have to worry about contamination problems. Um, a big problem when we started recycling old paper was the ink residue. That ink residue was actually hazardous material, guys. And so early on, we had a serious problem when we recycled that old paper. Paper, when we, we, we repulped it, is we had contamination concerns with the ink on it. And so even if we do the right things, guys, and we recycle it, we're going to produce waste, which is going to lead to contamination concerns. Now, I just wanted to share some numbers with you, um, hopefully to make you feel bad. So that if you are one of those people that does not currently recycle, that maybe you'll start and give recycling a try. So this was that 2015 study, guys, done by the EPA. Back then, they found that less than 35% of households in the U.S. and less than 10% of businesses actively recycled in the U.S. We use 400 billion plastic bags every year and yet we recycle less than 2% of them. I am in favor of um, what California is doing now. If you go into a grocery store in California, what do they do for a plastic bag? They charge you money, don't they? And so what are people doing? They're bringing in their cloth bags. By the way, I am a big proponent of cloth bags. Whenever I go to, to any store, I always bring my cloth bags uh, um, with me to reduce all that plastic bag waste. I would love to see here in Nevada, Southern Nevada, is um, grocery stores start to charge so people will begin to think about using those bags less and using more uh, cloth bags or recyclable bags more. We throw away approximately 22 billion plastic bottles every year. That's the, and once again, because of the market, guys, a lot of that stuff doesn't get recycled properly. And once again, a lot of us just don't care. So we'll just throw it away with the trash. Um, a growing component, or it, it used to be, guys, is something called e-waste or electro electronic waste, TVs, phones, and computers. Now, nowadays, smartphones are being recycled because there's money to be made. But if you think about it, most of your, um, sometimes you can recycle laptops, but if you look at the old tower computers or the old TVs, not the flat screens, guys, but the big monster TVs, um, there's no recycling for that. It's just not worth it to recycle, and so a lot of that is ending up in our landfills, okay? As technology improves with smartphones and with laptops, the the recycling rates are going to increase and we're starting to see them increase but I, back in the 80s and 90s guys man there a lot of those giant TVs simply couldn't be recycled even today nobody wants to recycle them and so people throw threw them away all right let's move off of solid waste and talk about a small component of that solid waste which is classified as hazardous we are going to define hazardous waste as any waste that poses a substantial or potential threat to either environmental health or to public health. We're really concerned about human health here, guys. Anything that is going to affect our health, we have to worry about. Now, generally, hazardous waste will exhibit one or more of the following characteristics. Uh, explosive or flammable, uh, you're corrosive like acids, you're chemically reactive, you're toxic, remember that means poisonous guys, you're radioactive, or you contain biomedical waste. So anything that has blood or bodily byproducts would also be classified as hazardous waste. Now, 
I know it's, it makes up a fairly small percentage of our MSW, guys, about 1%, but the problem is, is we can't treat hazardous waste the same way that we treated solid waste. You can't put these things in a sanitary landfill, guys. That is a big no-no. You have to properly dispose of it, and we'll talk about how we do this here in a couple minutes. Now, I know a lot of you thinking, well, I don't really use hazardous waste. Yes, you do, guys. Think about all the cleaning products, from oven cleaners to anything with bleach uh, to drain cleaners. All of that have chemicals that are extremely toxic. Pretty much, I always think of it this way. If the directions tell you to wear gloves or to wash your hands if you get any uh, of it of the product on you, that's letting you know it's toxic, guys. And so you're not supposed to. So let's say that you have a, a you just used all of a big container of bleach. You're not supposed to throw that bleach container in the trash, guys, because that is actually considered hazardous material. Now I know we do this but you're not supposed to because that bleach bottle has residue of bleach which then makes it hazardous waste. Now I want to take a look we talked a little earlier about the ocean dumping act guys I want to take a look at the two most important regulations concerning hazardous waste disposal. The first one is called the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act or RICRA which was passed in 1976. Now what RICRA did and what it was designed to do was to cut down on the waste, the hazardous waste that was illegally dumped in this country. Yeah, we'll dump hazardous waste, guys. We don't think about the public health issue. We just want to save a buck. So RICRA was designed to reduce all that hazardous waste that we, will, we were illegally dumping and so what it did is it created a cradle-to-grave system of record keeping. So let's say that we own a business, guys. Let's say that we own a chemical company. And we have reported to the EPA that we have 100 gallons of hydrofluoric acid. Very, very dangerous stuff. And one day, surprise, an EPA inspector shows up and says, okay, based on our records, you have 100 gallons of hydrofluoric acid. Show them to me. And let's say that we can only show them 50. Guess who's in trouble? We are, ladies and gentlemen. So if you use or generate hazardous material, you have to keep track of it from when you create it, the cradle, to when you properly dispose of it, the grave. This is what RICRA did. Now, has it worked? Yes. It, had the, it has reduced the amount of hazardous waste we have dumped in this country. Has it eliminated? No. There are still those unscrupulous people that try to get around the rules, once again, generally to save money. But it has reduced what we've, gener what we've dumped. The other one is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, also known as CERCLA. Nobody calls it CERCLA. Everybody calls it Superfund. This was a law that was passed in 1980 that created a fund to clean up some of the most toxic, polluted, hazardous waste sites across the U.S. It was working, guys. And how did we get the money? We taxed the companies that created the pollutants. So we would tax the, the coal companies and the chemical companies people that, that essentially created the problem in the first place. And it was working. In its heyday in the early 80s, guys, there was uh, billions of dollars in that fund, and we were slowly cleaning up these hazardous waste sites. Here's where the problem came in. Here's where it always comes in, in the political realm, guys. So the lobbyists for those companies went to uh, our political leaders um, and said, we want you to stop taxing us. Now, was money exchanged? I don't know. Maybe. But our political leaders then said, okay, we'll stop doing that. And so even though CERCLA is still a law on the books, there is no money. Okay. Unfortunately, lobbyists run this country, guys. Once again, my opinion, but a lot of people agree with me. They tend to be the most powerful 
people in, in this country. And so here's a problem, something that was working, that we were using that money for a good reason to clean up these, these hazardous dumps, now is toothless. There's no money. And so even though there are Superfund sites that are getting cleaned up, uh, a lot of that money is coming from local or state coffers, not the federal coffers. Now let's talk about how we can dispose of hazardous waste. Now we can still use landfills, guys, special landfills. So we can still isolate that hazardous waste, but as you might expect, these special landfills, because of regulations, um, are a lot more restrictive and therefore cost a lot more money to build. And so to bury or to isolate hazardous waste is a very very expensive process if you're going to utilize these special landfills we can recycle certain types of hazardous waste um, I always think um, batteries like double AA, a triple a but we can also recycle car batteries that's hazardous waste um, and there are certain I know we haven't talked about nuclear energy guys but fuel rods uh, a part of that material, that uranium or thorium, can be recycled to make new fuel rods. So there are some, not all, you can't recycle all hazardous waste, but there are some that can be recycled, can be reused again, repurposed. Neutralization. Let's say that we have a very, very strong acid, and we want to reduce its potency. What we would do is we would add a strong base to it. If you remember your high school chemistry class, guys, strong acid plus a strong base yields water. And so this is this neutralization. So often a lot of times, if we have corrosive chemicals, we'll add um, something to it to make it less dangerous, to make it less corrosive. This is neutralization. Uh, we can also, we have uh, the incineration option for certain types of hazardous waste. You can't burn everything, guys. But there's a process that is used called pyrolysis. It's actually not burning in the common sense. What it is, is you have a special oven that thermally decomposes this hazardous waste without the addition of oxygen. So it's not a, a pyrolysis oven is not a true normal incinerate different process that breaks it down as you might imagine guys um, pyrolysis ovens cost a lot more to build and operate so once again our costs go up in fact if you're talking about hazardous waste in general it's going to cost a lot more to dispose of to properly dispose of than our normal solid waste so the costs do go up now, I also wanted to share with you guys a couple what, what are called alternative methods for the disposal of hazardous waste. The first one is something called phytoremediation. What this is, it's the planting of trees and other green vegetation. In essence, guys, we're planting our autotrophs. And what happens is these plants uptake the contaminants and neutralize them themselves. So, as in essence, we're letting nature clean up our mess, guys. Now, this works for both hydrocarbon contaminants and for heavy metals. So, if we let's say that we have a site that has mercury, a heavy metal contamination, we could plant trees. The trees would absorb the mercury through their roots. Now, the trees would die, guys, from mercury poisoning, and guess what the dead trees now are? Hazardous waste. But we can then transport them to a pyrolysis oven and thermally decompose them. So it does work with both hydrocarbon contaminant and heavy metal contaminants. Just know that if you do have heavy metal contamination, you're going to lose. I, I, the average uh, loss is about half. So within the first year, 
depending on the initial concentration, you're going to lose half of the treats. They're going to die because they simply absorb too much heavy metal contamination and then die from the higher doses. But it does work. And so, once again, this has been used, I would say, since the 1980s. We started to use phytoremediation on a global scale. The good news is, is this has shown to work on thousands of sites across the earth. It's cost effective, guys. Think about it. Well, let's say that we had a, a um, site that had mercury contamination. Essentially, what we, we would do before is we would transport all that soil off-site, clean it up, and bring it back. That's expensive, guys. This is much more cost-effective. The one thing, though, is this requires time. So if you plant your trees, you need the trees to grow, add, add mass to themselves before they, they begin to absorb those contaminants, and so it's going to take years, if not maybe even a decade, before you're finally going to see results. But cost effective, and it works on both petroleum contaminants and heavy metals, bioremediation uh, has, has been more widely used over the last couple of decades. Uh, this was a picture of an old... North Carolina, Carolina Coast Guard base. Um, it was in operation for about five decades, from 41 to 91. You can imagine what kind of motor oils and, and gasolines that were spilled in this area. And so they decided to rip everything out, and they went in and they planted one of these tree farms. The other good news, guys, is they great PR. Look at the sign here. So the people that are living in this area the Coast Guard is, is letting you know, okay, hey, we know we screwed up. We know we have contamination here. We're taking care of it, and this is what we're doing. The other of these new alternative methods is something called bioremediation. So phyto is the use of plants. Bioremediation is the use of bacteria and other microorganisms to break down petroleum contaminants. Now, bioremediation actually occurs on its own. Let's say that we have a, 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 um, a drum of oil and, and we accidentally dump it. There will be bacteria in the soil that will break down those hydrocarbons. But what we've discovered is a process called enhanced bioremediation. What this is, is we inject a food source into the subsurface. The bacterial colony with a new source of food grows much bigger than it would naturally. And so now you have this big colony that once the food is gone, it will then turn and attack the contaminant that's present. This is called enhanced bioremediation. Now, I worked on a site when I was an environmental consultant back in the day. I worked on a site where we did this. It was an old dry cleaning facility. And so there was, there was hydrocarbons, chlorinated hydrocarbons on site. What we did is we took food grade molasses, we mixed it with water so that it wasn't so viscous, and we injected it into the subsurface. So the molasses acted as a food source. The bacteria ate the molasses, the colony grew in size, and then the colony attacked the chlorinated hydrocarbons that were present. And once again, guys, bioremediation or enhanced bioremediation has been shown to work on thousands of different sites across the globe, is still cost effective, guys. The one thing is it requires time, okay? The site that I was working on, um, I, I think uh, from the original injection of molasses, it took about two or three years to finally see those concentrations begin to decline. But as they did, it went fairly swiftly. Now, the other problem with bioremediation is it works great on petroleum contaminants, hydrocarbons, but it has no effect on heavy metals. 
the bacteria, just like most biological organisms, want nothing to do with heavy metals. So if you have a site with heavy metals, phytoremediation will work as long as you realize you're going to lose a lot of trees that first year and you're going to have to dispose of them as hazardous waste, but bioremediation will not work. So if we go back to that mercury site, that site that had high levels of mercury in the soil, you can't use bioremediation. The bacteria want nothing to do with it. And so this is the end of our waste discussion.